Many people know Mr. Power Wars through many different ways. Uh, are we still okay in heat wise? All right. I can't tell. I got to see that. <laughs> heat wise, some as students, some as friends, and some as relatives. I know that we've shown videos of Mr. Power Wars when he was inducted into the Museum's Hall of Fame, and that was very nice. Allow me, I will say things in the first person. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a microphone. Oh, that's a microphone. It's not <laughs> what you say? Stay tight, so don't worry. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Fireboard Ajak. It was around 1978. That was right before the revolution in Iran, when the Shah was in charge of the country and, the, and on the eve of the takeover of the Ayatollah. On the very evening when martial law was put into place, I decided I would leave the country and come to America. It was the very next morning that I left. I went to the American Embassy and tried to get my visa. It was really hard to get a visa during that time. Now, it was at this time, I was only a teenager. I was 13, only 14 years old. My brother, Fadi Matz, was already here in America, and he got me an invitation from the high school in Santa Maria. I was actually supposed to go with my sister, but she wasn't able to join me at the time, so I had to travel by myself. I got a plane ticket that would take me first to Paris, then New York, then in Los Angeles. When the plane stopped in Paris, we got off. Now, I didn't speak any English, so I was very confused and I, I didn't know what was going on. So I walked around the airport and actually missed my flight to New York. No one could help me because, and I, I didn't know what terminal to go to, and then I finally saw a terminal called Air Iran. They spoke Farsi, so they told me what was going on, and they were very kind to me and helped me out. See, the page isn't big. <laughs> okay, just in case you're worried. He's got a big speech. They had to send me to another airport to get my flight, which wasn't leaving until the next day. Then they got me a taxi. When I got into the other airport, I stayed there all night, and I was so afraid to miss a flight, I didn't sleep a wink. Finally, I got on the plane, and it went first to New York. Now, meanwhile, my brother didn't know I missed the plane, and there they were extremely worried when I didn't arrive in L.A. They didn't, pan they didn't want to panic my mother, so they didn't call her. I had to actually buy another ticket to Los Angeles when I arrived, 18 hours later. I called my brother, who was very relieved and very happy I was all right. I stayed with Farimaz for a few weeks in Los Angeles, which was around October 5th. He did something for me which was really great for me, but I didn't really understand it at the time. He shipped me off to a friend of his named Sean, way up in San Maria, California. Farimaz wanted me to become immersed in the English language, so he felt the best way I should should learn was to live with an American family and be surrounded by people who only spoke English. As a teenager, I was still going to need to go to school, so it was there on October 28th, they drove me to the local high school and dropped me off. Now, October 8th is just a few days before Halloween. And in America, people tend to dress up in all sorts of costumes, and even all the teachers dressed up as well. I'll never forget that day. <laughs> when I saw everyone all dressed up in weird outfits, it completely freaked me out. Literally, I was completely freaked out. I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't know what was going on, so I ran outside the front door, got on the curb of the high school, and I cried. And I cried and cried. It was all scary to me. I was so confused. I didn't know what to do. So I didn't go to any of my classes. I just sat there until 3 p.m. when my ride arrived. I told him what happened and he chuckled and laughed and explained to me what Halloween was all about and the tradition of dressing up. Now growing up in Santa Maria was an eye-opening experience for me. The people were very nice to me, but I w they were always a little puzzled by me. The hostage takeover didn't occur, so no one was familiar with Iranians. Everyone thought I was Spanish and I couldn't understand, they couldn't understand why I couldn't speak Spanish. <laughs> In order to learn the language even more, I used to love to watch television. Late Night with Johnny Carson was great, but I really learned more by watching the cartoons. They spoke slowly, and Tom and Jerry was my favorite cartoon. <laughs> the one thing I did have in common with everyone, and it was something that allowed me to break the ice a bit, was my guitar. 
it allowed me, it allowed people in high school to open up to me a little more. I knew three American songs really well. Hotel California, Dust in the Wind, and Carry On My Wayward Son. <laughs> I knew these by heart and would play them all the time. The one thing I didn't know were the actual words I was singing. I could play, play them back and forth, but didn't understand what I was saying. I just sang the words. I just mimicked mm -hmm. everything. It wasn't until ten years later, when I was becoming very comfortable with speaking English, that an experience occurred to me that nearly took my breath away. I was in a restaurant. And in the background, music was playing, dust in the wind. I heard it. I put my plate down, and I could barely breathe. It was at that moment when I heard the words being sung, I actually understood them. I fully understood what dust in the wind actually means. I immediately went out and bought all the records of all the songs I had sung, so I could now listen and understand the words that were being sung. Later, I moved back with my brother in Torrance. I went to study computers at UCLA. Computers were still new, and I wanted to learn programming. Meanwhile, I got a job as a busboy in order to support myself. I decided to take martial arts class and came across a kung fu school taught by Cam Yuen. It was called Thai Manus Academy, and, and Cam Yuen was very big at the time. He was the choreographer for the kung fu TV series. My brother and I signed up. He only lasted one day and didn't want to go back. <laughs> it took me an hour to walk to the studio back, back up and back. And that got really tiring, so I only lasted a month. Then later we moved to San Fernando Valley, and I wanted to find a martial arts school that I could train in. We looked all around, and I couldn't find anything we liked. I managed to get a job in North Hollywood at a place called Peck Sales. Gene Peck was the owner, and he was always very nice to me. He, he, I would take the bus every day back and forth to work. I found a karate school nearby with a guy named Mike Stone. He was, in a, he was the instructor, not the point fighter, but he was an instructor. He was a bald guy, a short guy, and he could break bricks with his head. And I was on my way to sign up. My roommate Cyrus said he was going to the summer place and he wanted me to come along. I said, hey, wait a minute. I'm already going to sign up at Mike Stone's place. He goes, no, 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 come with us. We're, we're going to go, and this guy's much better, so you have to come with us. So me, Cyrus, and Fuse went to there together. It was Steve Sexton who was teaching, and he looked really good. <laughs> and once uh, I saw all those amazing kicks and how cool Steve was, that was it for me. I had to sign up. My friend Cyrus, Fuse, and I start, and all started. Cyrus didn't last, but Fuse got his black belt. And it was, and that was it for me. I meant, I went there every day. I got up at four, went to class, and stayed there to a close around 9 p.m. I took all my classes and watched the other classes. I met Mike Payson, who was there. He was my training partner, and he was always one belt ahead of me. But he was very famous. He could do everything, so I always looked to him to, for a lot of my training. Then, when I was a red belt, an opportunity came along. I actually managed to buy a brand new car for the first time. I saved up for six or seven years. It was a yellow Toyota Salica. Do they still have Salicas today? Yes. <laughs> well, they were cool at the time. <laughs> I was so excited I didn't even uh, have to take the bus anymore. It was my first week and I was going back and forth to my karate school and my new car. Now, I, one day I came to the school and Steve had a partner named Hoyt and he wanted to close the school. Hoyt, Hoyt told me I could buy him out. I had no idea about buying out and I didn't know what actually I was doing, but I was so excited I decided to buy him out and I signed my, over my brand new car to him. Oh, wow. He gave me one third of his school, but I still had to make payments on the car for another four years. <laughs> so here I was with no car back to the bus again. <laughs> I remember Gene Peck, the owner of the place where I worked, came to me and he lent me $200 and he took me to a place where we can buy a car. I bought a Dodge Dart used one for $165. It was a piece of crap, but it was my car. <laughs> it was then that Steve decided to give me one of his thirds of the school and when the school was able to make fun, enough funds, I could buy out the last third. 
two was pretty, now it was pretty much on my own. I taught all the classes, which were mostly kids, and the school was located on Topanga and Van Owen. To get more exposure to the school, I started entering tournaments. I really enjoyed forms, and I went around watching people perform. It was Simon Rees' tournament, Valley of the Giants, was my first tournament that I saw. Stuart Kwan, who was a big competitor at the time, and I became good friends, and he taught me a lot in how to do forms. So I really worked hard, entered tournaments, and met Michael, who headed the magazine, and we became friends. We did a lot of things together, and I even got the cover of the magazine. Now at the location where I was teaching, the building was sold, and the new Lord landlord wanted $2,200 a month, which is more than I could handle. So we moved to Sherman Way in Barrio, and we were there for six months, and through an incredible opportunity, I met Salvador and his wife, Anna. They were my students. He said, I see something in you, and I know you can do better than this. We went looking around, and he found a place on Victory Boulevard. He said, to go by and look at the place. I said, oh no, that's too big. There's no way I can do this. He says, I don't have the money. He said, what does it take? I said, first, last, and security, which is around $14,000. We talked to the landlord. And I told Salvador, this is a very nice place, but there's just no way. So he turned around and looked at me. And he said something I'll never forget. He said, you know you're going to make this, right? I said, yes, but I can't do it. He goes, then I'm going to give you a loan. Wow. I'll never forget that day he wrote a check for me for $14,000. Wow. This was nothing. There was nothing inside but a carpet, and that was it, and I called it Firewars of Jacques Martial Arts Academy. And in short, that was how it all began. So I'm going to do this a couple opposite ways. I'm going to ask our dear friends to bring up the guitar. Oh, okay. Just in the wind. Oh, you're fine. fine. Any reactions? Uh, I was. Michael, honest to truth, I don't even know if I can play. One <laughs> chorus. No, I'm telling Everybody, you. Everybody, yes! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you look good holding it. You look like home. Yeah, my fingers. Are <laughs> so I'm going to have Carvers come up, and then we're going to have a few people say a few words in his behalf. So without further ado, I'm very proud to announce Carvers and Shock Day, and present you with your certificate. Oh. Thank you guys.